have your Bibles in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, read, uh, starting at verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, that's the Father, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and seven is the complete number, and it indicates the completeness of the work of the Spirit, <clears throat> the one Spirit, in uh, His uh, complete work, and then from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. This is who He is. Now, the subject, Revelation's theme, as we've talked before, is Jesus Christ theme of the whole Bible is the same thing in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, he, and, and this is who he is. He's a faithful witness. He's the first begotten of the dead. He's the prince of the kings of the earth. And that's what we talked about last Wednesday night. Now, here's what he's done. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us king and priest unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here's what he's going to do. Behold, he cometh. He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. It's wonderful who Jesus is. It's wonderful that Jesus is the faithful witness and that he is the first begotten of the dead, the first one to come out of the grave and uh, to come out with his immortal body. Others have been raised from the dead but with their mortal body. They all died again. But Jesus is the first begotten of the dead in that Jesus is the first one to come out of the grave with his immortal body never to die again. And he is the prince of the kings of this earth. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. That's who he is. It's wonderful to meditate on and think upon the greatness of Jesus Christ. But now listen. Listen to what he's done. Unto him that loved us. And, you know, the Bible talks about that in the book of Romans chapter 8. In a series of questions that Paul gives to the Roman church. He says, uh, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? But how do we know God is for us? How do we know He loved us? He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? He goes on to ask a few more questions there in Romans chapter 8. And this is, this is wonderful, comforting Scripture. And he says there, um, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again 
who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You know, what, what I see in that passage of Scripture is this. He asks the question, who is he that condemneth us? And the one that condemns us, the one who's capable of condemning us, is Christ. But listen, listen to this description of Christ. The one who is capable of condemning us, he is the one that died for us and that rose again and that right now is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. The the same one that has the power to condemn us is the one that died for us, rose again from the dead, and is right now making intercession for us at the right hand of God. You you know, I, I think sometimes that we get a wrong impression of Christ and we think that Jesus is ready to throw us away at the first sign of failure in our life. But I don't think that's the way Jesus is. And I think that this passage of Scripture makes that very clear to us, that the one who is capable of condemning us is the one that died for us, rose again from the dead, and right now makes intercession for us at the right hand of God. So the one that is praying for you, who died for you, unto him that loved us. Listen to this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him. What does that say? Through him that did what? Loved us. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's how we are conquerors. We are conquerors because he loved us. This is who he is. This is what he's done unto him that loved us. In the past, there is a there is a undeniable historical testimony of the love of God to us on a hill called Calvary where Jesus went and shed his blood. He loved us on the cross of Calvary. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Brother, this is the gospel. This is the good news that God loved us. In his Son, Jesus Christ, God loved us. And who, who was it that he loved? Righteous people, good people. He loved us while we were yet sinners. So, while we were cursing and committing adultery and living like the devil, Jesus still loved us and went to the cross. And as one song says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. He looked ahead. He saw us. He knew us ahead of time. He knew how we was going to live conduct ourselves. He knew that we'd all be sinners, and yet Jesus loved us and died for us. But He doesn't just love us. He didn't just love us in the past. He continues to love us right now. You are loved of God. We sing a song at, at the nursing home that little children sing. And they sing along. You know, they know it. Most of them, almost all of them know it. Jesus loves us. This I know, for the body tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Y'all heard about the professor that was asked by a student, what is the most profound truth you have ever discovered in the pages of the Bible? He said, come back tomorrow and I'll tell you. Next day in class, 
He said, I've got an answer for you. The most profound truth I have ever discovered in the Bible is Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Every other religion in the world has a dread of their God. Serve their gods with fear and with torment. But this religion, we have a God who loves us, a God who cares about us, a God who gave His only begotten Son for us. Hallelujah! I'm glad, brother, that Jesus loved us, proved it by dying for us, and right now we have the assurance that Jesus loves us. This is what He's done. He loved us. Not only did He love us, but He also, as the Scriptures say in my text, that He washed us from our sins in His own blood. He washed us. He cleansed us. Uh, this word cleanse and this word wash uh, indicates that, that something God does something on this inside of us through the blood of Jesus that nothing else could do. He washes us from our sin in His own blood. I remember when God saved my soul. I was 13 years old. That's been a long time ago. But it's still fresh in my mind what God did for me that night at the mourner's bench in Decoe, Georgia, when I walked the sawdust trail. I mean, literally walked the sawdust trail and knelt at the old mourner's bench and cried and prayed and sought God. So the peace of God came into my heart and the Lord washed my sins away. I'm telling you, it was it was it was a real. Um, I was conscious of that fact that God had washed my sins away. I felt like somebody had washed me on the inside with a powerful detergent, and they had. They had washed me. Jesus had washed me with His blood. I felt so clean on the inside, and I felt this heavy load lift off of me. God washed me in the blood of Jesus and freed me from my sins that night. This is what the blood of Jesus does for us. Cleanses us from the guilt of our sin and frees us from the power of our sin. This is what the blood of Jesus does. Later on, you know, he's going to, uh, uh, John is going to focus on the blood of Jesus over and over in the book of Revelation. He's going to take us into a scene in heaven. In Revelation chapter 5, where there are four living creatures around the throne, crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and four and twenty elders that represent the saints of God from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. And they begin to sing a song around the throne when the Lamb of God goes and takes that seven-sealed book, and they sing a song and say, Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou art slain. And thou hast redeemed us by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So they focus on this fact that they are redeemed, they're washed, they're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, this is going to be a theme in eternity. What we are talking about here tonight is going to be a theme in eternity, brother. Oh my, it ought to thrill our souls. That somebody bought us, set us free, washed us in the blood of Jesus Christ. And for all eternity, we're going to be glorifying Christ for this very fact that He washed us from our sins in His own blood. In, in, later on in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, <clears throat> We have a scene there in Revelation chapter 12 of this dragon, you know. And he, he, he's in, in, in waging war with Michael, the archangel. And he's defeated. And he's thrown out of the heavens into the earth. 
and there's a woe pronounced on the inhabitants of the earth. Woe unto you, because the devil, Satan, has come down on you, having great wrath. But then the Scriptures say in verse 11, they overcame him. Well, how did they overcome him? How did they overcome this dragon, this serpent, this Satan, this devil? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They overcame him. You know, this is, a, this, is a, this is what the Scriptures teach us, that every one of us is supposed to be an overcomer. And when you read, later on, we'll maybe get into this some, but when you read in the, about the, the messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor, there's a promise made there of, of reward to every church to those in that church who overcome, to them that overcome, will I give to sit with me in my throne, even as my Father gave me to sit with Him in His throne. And I'll give Him a new name. And on and on, you know, He tells us the reward of those that overcome. So this is how we overcome. By the blood of the Lamb, brother we overcome by trusting in what Jesus has done for us on the cross of Calvary. We don't under overcome the devil because we make up our mind to do better. We don't overcome the devil because we've got a strong will. We overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome the devil by what Jesus has done for us. When we get to the judgment, what's going to matter is, did we trust in what Jesus did for us? The blood of Christ washes us, cleanses us, frees us, and gives us overcoming grace. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. So, this is what He's done. He, uh, he has washed us from our sins in His own blood. And He has made us Unto our God, kings and priests. He's made something. He's made something out of us. Out of those servants of sin. Out of those wrecked lives. Out of those shameful lives. The blood of Jesus took us where, from, from where we were in the uh, trash pile of the world, He took us out of that trash pile and He made something out of us. He, by His blood, He transformed servants into kings, made us unto our God kings and priests. He, he mentions that again in Revelation chapter 5 where they're singing about the, the song of the redeemed. And they say, Thou hast bought us with your blood and made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. Now, when is He going to make us kings and priests? We well, already have. He already has made us kings and priests. We, we already are part of His kingdom. Already He's given us authority in His kingdom. Already, we are made to rule, brother. When God created Adam in the beginning, when He created Adam and Eve and put them in the garden, He gave them dominion over the earth. He made them to rule. You hear me? I said God made us to rule. And now then Jesus has rescued us from servanthood to sin. And He has transformed us and made us kings and priests. We are rulers. We are no longer servants to sin. We are rulers. We, we are not subject to the sin. We are not subject to Satan. We rule. I'm telling you that God has freed us from sin. We are no longer servants to sin. We rule over that which once ruled over us. 
Isn't that right? How what Jesus did for us. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I'm thankful, brother. Let, let, just a few verses down. John is uh, describing himself or identifying himself to the people that he's writing to. And he says, I, John, who am your companion in tribulation and uh, also in the kingdom and uh, and in help me in the patience in the patience of what? of Jesus Christ so, so I, I am your companion in tribulation and in the kingdom oh, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute John you, you mean you're, you're in the Isle of Patmos and you're in the kingdom yep I'm your companion in the kingdom. Already. You see, the kingdom of God is present wherever Jesus rules and reigns in the hearts of men. His kingdom is present in my heart if Jesus rules in my heart. His kingdom is present in your heart if Jesus rules in your heart. His kingdom is present in your home if Jesus rules in your home. Wherever the will of God is done, that's where the kingdom of God has come. And if the will of God is done in us, the kingdom of God has come to us. John says, I'm in the kingdom now. And he, we are made kings in that kingdom. We rule with Jesus. We, are, we have been given authority over the devil. You say, preacher, he gives me a whole lot of trouble. But listen, if we understand this right, if we get this down right, it won't be the devil giving us so much trouble We'll be giving him some trouble. But the Bible tells us, Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Who's he talking about? Anybody that submits themselves to God. This, this is the secret of our authority over the devil. If you submit yourself to God, you can resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. If you're not submitted to God, forget it. The devil will steamroll you. And he will do you like he did the seven sons of Sceva who heard the formula that Paul was using and went into this man full of the devil and said to him, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out of him. But the devil wasn't afraid of them because they didn't know Jesus. And, and they, they were not submitted to God. And they said, this, the devil said to that man, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? And they... Uh, attacked the man, and, and he fled. they fled from the house, attacked them in, and they, this one man attacked the seven men, and they fled from the house, uh, bruised and beaten and naked, because the power of the devil overcame them. But we are not subject to the devil, brother. You listen to me. We are not subject to the devil. The devil is subject to us in the name of Jesus, and because we are subject subject to Christ, Satan is subject to us. One woman testified and said, you know, the devil's been on my case all morning. When I got out of bed this morning, he was there. He's been on my case all day. And uh, Dr. Ravenhill was the one telling that. And he said, I think he was talking to her. He said, Sister, I don't, I don't expect the devil even knows who you are. I don't think you're important enough for him to give you personal attention. Well, that's probably true. The devil doesn't know everything. He's not everywhere at the same time. He has little devils that work under him. He assigns to different people. But he's got important business to do in Washington, D.C., London, England, and uh, Harvard University, and um, Jerusalem. He, he's got important business elsewhere to do. But even if it was him personally, the Bible says they overcame him. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, 
word of their testimony and love not their lives to the death. I'm telling you, I don't care how big the devil is. How big a devil it is, it's a sign to you. Jesus is greater. And whenever, uh, this is what the Scriptures say, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Now, you, you've got to believe some things, brother. If you don't believe some things that's written in the, in the pages of this Bible, the devil will steamroll you. I'm telling you, he'll, he'll, he'll beat you up. He'll have you groaning and moaning and saying, Uncle. All right? He will never do that to anybody submitted to God who knows the power of the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, he will never, he'll never get you to say, Uncle. Whenever you know the power of God and you are under the authority of Jesus Christ, you are a king. You've been made a king by the blood of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Y'all, I'm feeling better and better and I'm running out of time. You've been made a king and you've been made a priest. Now, I know, I know this, is, this is not the complete fulfillment of, of this Scripture. He said we shall reign on the earth. There will be a time that we will be given positions of authority on this earth in the reign of Christ at His coming. And you know, that's such an awesome thought. Uh, really, I don't think we think too much about our future and what God has promised in our future. You know, He told us that we're going to reign with Him on this earth. And He told us that you are going to judge angels. You know that? That you are going to judge angels. He's, he's talking to the Corinthians when they are running the, the law one against another, running to the, the, you know, to the law court of Corinth against one another. And he says, don't you have anybody in the ranks of the saints who can judge your matters? Don't you know that in your future you are going to judge angels? And you can't judge the smallest matters that arise among you? Now, you know, I don't think we think about the church like this very often, but the church is a judicial body. It really is. It is a judicial body. Justice is supposed to be dispensed in the house of God by wise people in the house of God when there is a crisis that arises. Y'all know, y'all know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 when there's a brother that sinned against another one. He's to go to him. If he can settle it privately, fine. He's ganged his brother. If he can't settle it privately, he takes two or three others with him. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word be established. If he won't hear those brethren, he needs to take it before the whole church. If he won't hear the whole church, the church makes a decision. They cut the brother off from the fellowship of the saints. He's no longer allowed at the tape, the Lord's table, and uh, he is uh, he is treated as a heathen and a publican. There's a judgment made there. I mean, it's a it's a law court, and God says when you do it the right way, heaven ratifies that decision. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Heaven will ratify that decision if we follow the biblical pattern. Isn't that right? I'm telling you. We, we have this awesome future. And we play around sometimes in this world without seeking the wisdom of God that belongs to people with such a responsible future. And I'll tell you what we ought to be doing as the people of God is preparing for that future. So we, we're going to be gathering the wisdom of God, gathering the Word of God in our hearts and minds, because in our future, we have great responsibilities in our future. Now, we have great responsibilities right here now, but that's coming today. We will judge angels. And so, you know, 
we, we want to act like kings. Right? We don't want to act like servants. We want to act like kings. And I don't mean that we go around with our head in there and our nose in there and we're looking down on everybody saying, I'm, I, I'm royalty and you are, you know, no good and nothing and compared to me. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about in the spiritual realm that we, uh, we have authority over Satan and sin. But we're also priests. God's made, Jesus has made us priests unto our God. You know what a priest is, don't you? In the Old Testament, a priest had two tasks. He represented men to God. And he represented God to men. That was his task. He represented men to God. He represented God to men. So we, we have this double task, brothers and sisters, as priests unto God. We represent men to God. We intercede. Our soul. We intercede for our brothers and sisters in Christ. I've been deeply disturbed over my brothers and sisters that have been sick and in our church and in our fellowship. And I've just I've walked the floors crying out to God for mercy for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, this is this is our this is what we are. We are priests unto God. And we intercede for one another. And we, we represent God to man. So we are, we, are, we are ambassadors for Christ. And we stand in Christ's stead. This is the words of Scripture. We stand in Christ's stead, appealing to men. Be ye reconciled to God. In other words, we speak to men as if Christ were speaking to them. Is that what it means? We stand and speak to men as if Christ were speaking to men. Brother, right now, right now in this pulpit, I am to speak unto you as the oracles of God in Christ's stead. So I, you know, when I come to this pulpit, I got to, I don't come here to just give my opinion on things and exalt Bill Prescott. I'm here in Christ's stand, appealing to men for Christ's sake, speaking to you as if Christ were speaking to you, to say to you what Christ would say to you. Isn't that, what, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Isn't that what we're all supposed to do with our life and with our testimony? To speak to men as if Christ were speaking to them. We stand in Christ's stead, pleading with men, be ye reconciled to God. So, i just relate this a little bit. I'm going to quit. My wife and I, went to Roanoke to Monday to uh, see the baby. We got a brand new member here in Hope. Uh, the Lambers had her baby. Beautiful little baby. They're at home now. And uh, we went up there and we stopped to get a uh, stopped at Walmart to get a basket of fruit for Brother Kelly from the church, and that we were going down there to see him. And this little young boy there in Walmart, that we, we was telling him what to put in the basket, and he was waiting on us. And he was he was really trying hard to do a good job and fix it up nice, and he did. He did a real good job. And while he's there tying the bows and doing all all this stuff, I, I I think to myself, this is an opportunity for me represent Christ here. And I say to the young boy, I say, son, I want to ask you a personal question. I said, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? And that little boy spoke to me words that I feel like would be very 
common in our society. He said, my parents go to a non-denominational church. He said, they didn't take me to church. He said, I've been to church one time, I believe he said. He said, I, I, don't, I don't know what I believe. And I, I felt compassion for that young man. I told my wife, I said, there's a lot of parents who are going to face a severe judgment because they did not train their children in the ways of the Lord. Didn't take them to church. Didn't pray with them. Didn't inform them about the ways of God. Didn't tell them about salvation. I don't know what I believe. I said, son, do you have a Bible? He said, I do. I said, well, then if you have a Bible, you have the instruction manual. And I said, if you'll read it, God will give you instructions on how to get to Him. I didn't have just a few minutes to talk to Him. But I sh He shook my hand. He said, thank you for the instructions. And we walked away. And I've been praying for that young man. This is who we are, priests unto God. We represent men to God. And we represent God to men. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are pleading with men. Be ye reconciled. Y'all, I'm going to stop there. I, I'm, I know I'm probably moving way too slow. But I feel like that we ought to pray tonight and ask the Lord, Lord, help us to appreciate not only who you are, but what you have done for us. And may that what Christ has died to accomplish be really true in our lives that we are kings and priests unto God, washed from our sin, and that we really fit the pattern that we see in the Scriptures of what Christ has done for us. Jesus is wonderful, folks. I'm telling you, Jesus is wonderful. Hallelujah. What, what was the song you sang, brother? King Jesus. What does it say? In Jesus. He hears me when I pray. And what did you girls say? It's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to trust Him at His Word. Just from Jesus. Simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. It is so sweet to trust in you. King Jesus. You know, here, here we are singing about Him, preaching about Him. And the Lord wants us to love Him with all of our heart. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And be thrilled about Jesus Christ. Tell the world about Jesus Christ. Live like Jesus. Represent Jesus before the world. Come on into these altars and let's pray before we go home.